This lecture is about coastal ecosystems. You will learn that protecting those coastal ecosystems may actually be protecting the coasts. And that coastal ecosystems are very much affected by human activity since most of the people live close to the ocean. Finally, coastal ecosystems may be much more effective than engineering measures such as dikes in fighting sea level rise. So what are coasts? Coasts can be, uh, can be thought of being a clash between two worlds. We have the three-dimensional gigantic space of the oceans encompassing 1.3 billion cubic kilometers. And that's colliding along a linear coastline with the two-dimensional land. And it's clear that uh, if you recognize that, there, it's, it's clear that there must already be a lot of geological and also biological action going on. Rivers are draining the land, and those rivers can be thought of as being the veins of all the activity that goes on in about 30% of the area of our globe. And these rivers drain everything except the polar regions and the deserts, which means that any activity far inland is directly affecting the ocean, since the rivers are transporting pollutants and nutrients, for example, and plastic waste into the oceans. At the same time, an increasing proportion of the mega cities are directly at the coast, and also an increasing proportion of the world population unfolds its activities along the coastlines. At the same time, marine diversity and marine ecosystem diversity is highest at the coastlines. So we basically have here, if you will, a clash between human population demands on the one hand and biological activity and ecosystem, marine ecosystem integrity on the other hand, at least potentially if we don't use the coastal ecosystems in a sustainable way. And of course, that's very often not the case. Pressures are so high in many areas of the world that, for example, many of the Caribbean coral reefs are now severely degraded. And the same is happening more and more in the Indo-Pacific region. Due to warming and nutrient pollution, many reefs have been lost and are now overgrown by opportunistic uh, algae. And they've lost their function to, to grow and to sustain sea level rise. We have macrophyte bats, seagrasses, and macroalgae that are equally lost at an unprecedented rate of about 5% per year, again, mainly through nutrient pollution and also direct destruction. So why should we care? We should care not just because those ecosystems uh, should be saved for their own sake, um, but they should also be saved because they provide very essential service to humans in particular along the coastlines. And here, first and foremost, that's coastal protection in the face of predicted sea level rise. It's having clear water to swim and to attract tourists. It's small-scale artisanal fisheries to have food from the oceans. And it's also nutrient retention to alleviate the nutrient pollution problem mainly coming from agriculture. So in our own interest, we should try to save these very vital ecosystem services that, are, that coastal ecosystems are providing to us. Let's now focus a little bit more on the coastal protection aspect. So we have soft sediment where coastal vegetation, marsh plants, and also seagrasses help in the accumulation of sediments. And, uh, Actually, they are very effective, in particular in tidal areas, in holding back suspended sediment and thereby uh, having the marsh area growing continually in a very natural way, simply by the in and outgoing ebb and tide that brings suspended sediments into these ecosystems. And this way, deltas historically have risen for example, after the last ice age with very dramatic increases in sea level. But nowadays, that's often prevented since they are dikes that do not allow the water to go to flow in and out with the sediment load anymore. Another example are coral reefs from the tropics. 
Here, a very low-lying um, islands in the tropics are very much dependent on having corals as protection against waves. There are estimates, good estimates from science that the waves uh, dissipate up to 97% of the wave energy, thereby protecting uh, coastal, uh, low tropical coasts and low-lying islands from devastating hurricanes, for example. And what is the really good thing about marsh plants and submerged vegetation and corals in contrast to dikes? They are living, and it means they grow. So they can naturally grow with an increasing sea level if we maintain their integrity and their function, whereas a dike or breakwater will not grow. So we should more and more make use of those biological engineers in order to protect our coasts. The effects uh, on, uh, on the coastal species, on coastal ecosystems, they didn't start uh, some decades ago, but many of them have a very long history. Sometimes <coughs> extinctions of um, very prominent animals already started in medieval times. There are, for example, reports from the Caribbean that green turtles were so abundant that <coughs> the sailing boats uh, coming from Portugal and Spain would constantly bump into them so that the sailors couldn't sleep at night because they were constantly colliding with green turtles. Since they're consumers of plants, their role in keeping low algae that would like to overgrow the corals cannot be overestimated. And <coughs> there was one first uh, key human perturbation that initiated the decline, the demise of Caribbean coral reefs, very probably. So this is the big problem of shifting baselines, which we particularly see in coastal areas. But the picture is not as yet that bleak. So we can also find good examples. For example, if you look here at a compilation over time divided in those four major historic periods, the relative abundance of, for example, um, wading and other <coughs> uh, uh, seabirds, then we do see that at least the decline has been stopped and that for some groups there has actually been a slight recovery in their population abundance. And <coughs> the same we see at least in some marine mammals uh, where at least the, the demise of their population <coughs> in uh, medieval and, and uh, industrialized periods um, has been stopped and some are actually now slowly recovering. So there's the possibility with the right management measures to turn the tide around and to bring coastal biodiversity at least back to some of the more pristine values. So how can we better coastal systems? And at this point, I would like to give you an example from the tropics again. So mangrove forests have a very important function for capturing sediments and for protecting coasts. And as a nursery for small crustaceans and for small fish um, that dwell uh, around their roots, about 50% of those mangroves <coughs> in the Indo-Pacific have now been clear cut to be replaced by shrimp aquaculture. So this coastal engineering um, service that they provide to humans has been lost. And um, so those two pictures now show you in a time series how this could look like um, uh, in one uh, middle American country, but I could show you the same picture for mangrove forests uh, in Asia, for example. And what we now can do in an ecological economics approach is that we can uh, weigh the benefits, the revenues generated from shrimp aquaculture against the costs, including public goods and ecosystem services, and see if that's a good bargain for the entire population of that very coastal country or not. So if you look at the value of goods in terms of timber from mangroves, that's uh, relatively limited here, below $100 per hectare per year. Uh, and the revenues, the net revenues when selling those shrimps from one hectare could be, let's say, about um, $2,000. Uh, then we have the function of fish nursery in the mangroves. That's again <coughs> um, some uh, $70. But we have this very, very high ecosystem service of eco uh, of um, of coastal pro uh, protection that has here been um, 
uh, calculated as being the equivalent of a dike that would offer the same protection. And then, uh, on, the, on the other hand, for the revenues of the shrimp production, of course, we have to take into account that subsidies subtract from, uh, from the complete income of a particular country, and uh, that we also have pollution costs, the so costs from the emission of nutrients after those shrimps have been fed that leach out of the shrimp aquaculture and that then cause other problems um, by overgrowing, for example, corals. And then finally, if we would like to restore the mangrove forest, this price ticket is very high, so that in balance, if we count all uh, uh, costs in terms of public goods and services that are incurred by setting up this uh, shrimp aquaculture facility, we are way in the negative area, whereas we are in the positive area had we maintained the mangrove forest. This example shows very beautifully how such an ecolog ecological economics approach can help us make sensible decisions and can help us to internalize costs, for example, in terms of nutrient pollution that are otherwise uh, normally externalized to being public costs to the detriment of the entire population that's living at that particular coastline. The take-home message. So coastlines are naturally really a clash of two worlds, the three-dimensional ocean, the two-dimensional land that's drained by the rivers, where the river mouths are directly at the coastline. So the human impact is maximal, and on the other hand, the potential diversity of the biology of the ecosystems is also very high, since the diversity hotspots are often along the coastline. At the same time, those Ecosystems provide very vital service. One of the most important ones in the face of increasing sea levels is coastal protection, both in soft bottom settings by marsh plants and on hard rock in terms of corals that can grow if they are intact against the rising sea level. And we need an urgently an integrated coastal management that takes into account all revenues but also all costs that normally are externalized to better manage the ecosystems at our ocean coastlines.